So today I'm at a cemetery that you've probably driven by. If you've ever come down Beckley Road in Battle Creek, you may not have given it a fleeting glance. It's between the water tower and some of the commercial businesses down here, Culver's and a, and a hotel. It's up on a slight hill. There's roughly about four to 500 uh, graves in this area. And it dates back to some of the earliest history of Battle Creek in this region. And there's some very interesting stories to tell. So come along and join me. Let's take a look at the Dubois Cemetery here in Battle Creek, Michigan. In 1836, Peter and Sally Dubois came from Greenfield, New York, along with their four children by way of the Erie Canal and wagon on a journey of four weeks until they arrived in Calhoun County. Peter purchased land on the southern side of Battle Creek, which today would be on both sides of Beckley Road, and he would, over time, along with his son, expand their holdings to just over 300 acres. The City of Battle Creek Board of Health, then known as Milton, purchased one acre from him to form a cemetery in 1839, which would bear his name as the Dubois Cemetery. The French pronunciation is Dubois, and often in English it is pronounced as Du Bois. In choosing which version to use in this video, I have opted to use the French pronunciation partly because all my French ancestors would probably haunt me, but mainly because my mother, who was fluent, found a lot of disciplinary uses for a kitchen rolling pin, which I so often deserved. I wouldn't want to risk that wrath again. Peter Dubois was described as a man who was universally respected as a citizen and neighbor. Also referred to in his obituary as a man of sober and industrial habits who conscientiously and faithfully discharged the duties growing out of the various relations of life. His wife, who had traveled with him from New York, passed away in 1869. About a year later, he remarried. Peter passed away in 1875. His sons were also successful and productive farmers. Harvey worked his land for 57 years in the community until he passed away in 1893. His brother James passed away two years later. His daughter, Antoinette, married Charles McCollum, and they purchased a farm in Van Buren County, taking the land from raw timber all the way to a working farm over a period of 25 years, raising three children and being very active in the Van Buren County community. Hector Adams was born in Burlington, Vermont in September of 1800. He grew up in Vermont and for a time was a teacher but eventually studied law and became a lawyer. During his time there, he was very active in politics and was an active supporter of William Henry Harrison for president. He was also on the same ticket as a senator for Grand Isle County. In 1823, he married Laura Merriam. He practiced law in Grand Isle County, Vermont until 1861. In 1857, he purchased farms in the Battle Creek area, and when he retired from the bar in 1861, he moved here with his family. During his time here in Michigan, he worked his farm, but also served as eight years on the Farm Bureau Fire Insurance Company until he died in 1875 while visiting family in Vermont. He's interred in Grand Isle County, Vermont. His wife passed away in 1889, and she was interred here at Dubois Cemetery. His son, Onyx Adams, spent his boyhood years in Vermont and was engaged in farming and teaching while he lived there. He married his wife, Bessie, and eventually moved here with his family and his sister in 1866. He took charge of his father's farm and devoted his time to cultivation and improvement of making it a valuable property. He was a well-known and respected individual within the community. He and Bessie had seven children. Interestingly enough, in the year that he died, he was called to test as a witness in a trial on the attempted murder case where his sister, Marie Butterfield Sanderson, was charged with attempting to murder her aged husband by feeding him pulverized glass in his oatmeal. 
Onyx Adams died before he could testify as a witness in 1899. Onyx and his wife Bessie are both interred here at DuBois Cemetery. Minerva Johnson is also an interesting story as an early pioneer. She was born in 1843 in Battle Creek Township and she was an infant when her parents relocated to Newton Township. She was married to Amos Johnson who was a farmer in Newton Township and they celebrated their golden wedding anniversary right before his death in 1909. She spent all of her life in Calhoun County, only traveling to Florida the last two years that she was alive. She told stories of seeing Calhoun County come from ox cart to automobile over her time. She passed away in 1933 at the age of 90. Aaron Moorhouse Sr. came from Saratoga, New York in 1835 and located in the southern area of Battle Creek where he converted raw land into a thriving farm. He built a brick house on the site and was well known in the community as a thrifty farmer and an active resident in the community. He passed away in 1856. His son Aaron Jr. continued the farm until his death in 1871. Aaron Sr. and his wife and Aaron Jr. and his wife all share the same monument and plot at Dubois Cemetery. The son of a shoemaker, Abraham Mingus, was born in 1818 and he worked in the shoe business with his father until at the age of 22 he made his way to Battle Creek, Michigan. He learned the trade of being a millwright, which he followed for several years. In 1849, in the excitement of the gold discovered in California, he abandoned his work here to join a company that was westward bound for the Golden State. He started his long journey across the plains and mountains with five wagons and ample supplies. He spent his time there engaged in coffin making, mining, and stock raising. Unlike many 49ers, Abraham Mingus thrived with success, eventually becoming dissatisfied with California, and having made out good financially, he returned to Battle Creek. He bought 200 acres of land and he eventually established the Mingus Mill, and Mingus Brook and several roads in this area are named after him. During his time here in Battle Creek, he served as a highway commissioner for 11 years, a justice of the peace for five years, and a member of the board of commissioners and the school board for about the same amount of time. He passed away in 1908 at the age of 89. Otis Green was born in Monroe County, New York in 1823. He was 18 years old when he came with his father to Michigan on a prospecting trip in 1844. They moved to Eaton County where his father purchased a farm near Chester and after a time Otis bought his own farm. At the age of 27, he married Mariette Harris, the daughter of Reverend Harris in Battle Creek. When he turned 30 years old, he sold his farm and moved to Battle Creek and purchased a 100-acre farm, going into debt at the time to do so. Through good industry, judgment, and economy, he paid off his debts and purchased an additional 50 acres. He served the township as superintendent for the poor and was said to not only have saved the taxpayers' money, but also gave careful attention to every case of destitution that he helped examine. He died at his home in 1901 at the age of 78. Now up to this point in the video I've covered a lot of the early pioneers that shaped this area but no intriguing video about a cemetery would be complete without delving into some stories of tragedy. So the next three stories will be of that nature. However, stick around to the very end as I intend to close this video out with a very epic story of success so that you don't go away feeling too sad. Frederick Beckwith was born in 1848, and he served in Company 1 of the Wisconsin 3rd Infantry Regiment during the Civil War. He mustered out in 1865, where he came to live in Battle Creek near Gogwak Lake on a small fruit farm. In 1910, he told his son he was going to withdraw his pension money, but did not come home. A little over 24 hours later, the next day, his body was found on the railroad tracks beneath a bridge near Augusta. Not far from his body was the body of another man lying dead on the tracks. The whole incident was quite mysterious. The men who found the bodies worked for the railroad and were informed about the existence of them from an unidentified stranger at the Augusta station. They both left to go look for the bodies, but when they returned to the station, the unknown man had disappeared. He was said to have purchased a ticket showing a wad of money and left on a train for Chicago. They identified Frederick and notified his son. It was never clear how he came to be in Augusta that day. The other body was unidentified but showed signs of having 
been hit with a blunt object in the back of his head. The police determined it to be an accident and they concluded that Frederick was walking on the bridge above and fell and that's how he died and they determined, I suppose, that the other man had been hit by the train. However, the whole thing could be interpreted as a mugging or a murder and the actual culprit could have been the guy who had the wad of cash and left for Chicago. Uh, the unknown man that was found on the tracks was thought to be a man named William Britton but no one came to claim his body. He was likely buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery as they determined that he was Catholic and at the time of these articles, some girls from the Catholic Church were raising money to bury him. Frederick, of course, was buried at the Dubois Cemetery. Joseph Allen was born in Vermont in 1814. He first arrived in Michigan in 1831, working all over the state as a surveyor. In the early days of his arrival, he was in Lansing when there was only one log house in the entire area. He helped to raise the second log house in Lansing, but suffered an injury during the project to his leg that ultimately resulted in it having to be amputated above the knee. As years went on, he still continued on as a surveyor, and he eventually settled in the Battle Creek area in 1863. For many years after, he suffered from a double hernia and took morphine for the pain. He also had asthma, which was so severe at times as he reached his late 60s to early 70s that he could no longer sleep in a bed. Instead, he would sleep in a chair in his living room. In 1885, his son woke in the middle of the night hearing his dog in the yard howling. So he went to let the dog in, but it was dark and although he noticed the figure of his father sitting in the chair, he assumed he was sleeping as usual, so he went back to bed. Joseph's wife woke in the morning to discover Joseph had slit his own throat somewhere in the night and was sitting with a bucket of blood underneath him and a razor next to his side. It was supposed that he had taken a large dose of morphine and then killed himself, but wanted to limit the mess. They found a note laying next to him and had writing on both sides. On one side it read, I do this so that no one may be charged with the responsibility of the act. It is right for me to avoid suffering. I say to the family, goodbye. You have been good to me. With regard to our mutual future, we are in the hands of him who doeth all things well. Goodbye from Father J. Allen. And on the reverse side, written in more shaky handwriting, which they assumed he had written after he'd taken his dose of morphine, he wrote, I have said all, I think it best necessary to say, simply goodbye to all from your father, Joseph Allen. So the police were notified and inquiry was made and after the investigation, they concluded that his death was a suicide. He was 71 on the day that he died. Just as a note, I found two different references to the year that he arrived in Michigan. One was 1831, another was 1832. Also, the year of his birth was written as 1812, but on the tombstone, it says 1814. So, there are some discrepancies. John Foster was a farmer who owned a 160-acre parcel where he and his wife raised several children. In early January of 1872, a nephew of Mr. Foster came to visit and brought along with him a case of smallpox. As a result, John and his wife and children were all infected and became very ill. The outcome was quite catastrophic. The newspaper accounts indicate that John, his youngest daughter, and two sons all died on a Tuesday night in early February 1872. The rest of the family were able to get vaccinated and were not near as ill and they survived. There's varying info on this on findagrave.com. They indicate they died on different days over two weeks but that cannot be entirely accurate as the day they have indicated for the last son dying was February 16th. And there are articles dated as early as February 8th that state that the son was already passed away. So what I believe happened is the death certificates were written over a period of two weeks as each of the individual family members were buried. This being February, it probably took some time to make those arrangements at that time of year with the ground being frozen and that sort of thing. So with that hypothesis, 
hypothesis is accurate, then it may indicate that the news accounts are probably more likely to be accurate because there was two separate papers telling the same story that all four family members died on the same Tuesday evening. Nevertheless, it's still chilling to consider that almost an entire family was wiped out by the smallpox epidemic. The 1873 atlas shows the land being owned by Mrs. Foster, and I wasn't able to determine what happened to her ultimately, but it doesn't appear that she's buried at Dubois Cemetery. Now let's put behind us these tragedies and look at a family that left an indelible imprint on the future of Battle Creek and the state of Michigan. Alan Hayes Willard was born in Heartland, Vermont in 1794. He married his first wife, Eliza Barron, in 1823, and she passed away in 1836. A few years later, he married his second wife, Laura Vetter. Traveling by means of ox team over land and by means of the Erie Canal, like so many New Englanders did in those days, he arrived in Michigan in 1836. He purchased land and created a homestead on the Gogwak Prairie and today this area of land is a residential neighborhood and part of the sections of Riverside Elementary School. Alan Willard was characterized by an independent way and by an ardent love of literature, particularly the classics, which he kept up his reading in the Greek and Latin languages throughout the final years of his life. The two books that during the last years of his life that were literally worn to the edges that he used constantly was the New Testament and a bound and printed edition of the Constitution of the United States. For visitors to his home, he always had some question ready regarding the teachings of Paul from the New Testament or the U.S. Constitution. For Alan Willard had been educated at Dartmouth, so it's not surprising that he educated his own two sons, George, who was born in 1824, and Charles, who was born in 1827. He gave them access to his own personal library to study in his beautiful home on Gogwak Lake. He personally oversaw their education, and it was remarked that his two sons received the equivalent of a college education in their day from their father. Allen passed away in 1876. His oldest son, George Willard, went on to become a U.S. representative for the state of Michigan's 3rd District, serving from 1873 to 1877. When he returned to Battle Creek after leaving office, he continued his love of journalism. He owned the Battle Creek Journal until his death in 1901. Prior to becoming a U.S. congressman, he did graduate from Kalamazoo College in 1844, then later taught school and eventually served on the Michigan State Board of Education and then in the Michigan State House of Representatives before finally running for U.S. Congress and serving two terms. The younger son, Charles Willard, was also a successful local businessman. At one point, he had over 125000 in stock in the Advanced Thresher Company, which was a considerable amount back in those days. He died before George did, and when he passed away, in his will, he left $40,000 to build a building for the YMCA here in Battle Creek. He also left another $40,000 to build the Willard Library, and another $30,000 for the Baptist College in Kalamazoo. Charles also deeded 16 acres on the shore of Lake Gogwak to the city of Battle Creek for a public park prior to his death. When George died in 1901, the mayor of the city ordered the flags to be flown at half-mast for the day. Charles and Alan Willard are buried at the Dubois Cemetery. George is buried at Oak Hill. Upon the passing of Charles Willard in 1897, the Battle Creek Moon wrote an extensive article on the Willard family, particularly commenting on the contributions of Charles Willard and his donations from his estate to the community. And in that article, they state the following. The name Willard is of Saxon origin, comprised of two words, will and ard, which means a man of a willful disposition. This is perhaps a characteristic of the family at least it has been quite marked in many members so that's going to do it for today's journey through history at the Dubois Cemetery here in Battle Creek if you like today's video please take a minute to hit the like button subscribe to the channel leave me a comment tell me what you thought and 
Of course, share the video with others.